Hey there, fools. Mr. T here. And I'm going to be doing a playthrough of a classic, the classic platformer, and that is Super Mario Brothers. Um, this was a request for, uh, by one of my subs. Um, can't think of his name right now. Uh, he's a friend of King Grimpachi. Um, he asked that I go through uh, Super Mario Brothers the original without um, warping and um, I guess he, for him that was some kind of a litmus test <laughs> to see if I was a true Nintendo fan because only a true Nintendo fan can beat Mario Super Mario Brothers the original without uh, warping just going straight through and uh, so that's what I'm doing can you believe that I'm making a video uh, on the request of one subscriber. How about that? That's dedication. But yeah, anyway, here we go. Obviously, this is World 1-1. One, one. And I'm going to do my best to not bore the crap out of you guys. Uh, I'll try to keep it interesting, talk about some stuff. Uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> some things that I did around the time that, you know, I first played this game. Um, you know, my love of platformers and what uh, brought me to them. Uh, but let me first uh, mention... Uh, that obviously Super Super Mario Maker came out recently, and uh, I made the mistake of playing that game before doing this uh, playthrough. And I call it a mistake because the controls <laughs> are very different um, in Super Mario Maker uh, from uh, the original Super Mario Brothers. There's a lot more uh, leeway and uh, leniency with the platforming um, in the original here. Once you jump in a direction, you have uh, not, not very much uh, pullback. Like, you know, you can jump midair and then kind of pull back uh, if you feel like you're screwing up that jump. Well, you can't really do that too much in the original Super Mario Brothers. Once you commit to a jump, you commit it, and uh, you're probably gonna fall <laughs> or uh, land on something you don't want to. So, yeah, I made a mistake of playing through that, or you know, starting Super Mario Maker and then having to go back to the original controls, and it was definitely a curve. So, anyway, um, some of you fools may know um, I'm a huge fan of platformers. Um, one of the first platformers I remember playing is probably Pitfall, uh, the original on the Atari 2600, and. Uh, I just remember, you know, I, I really liked video games, you know, from the early 80s and uh, but they always felt like they were missing something, you know, um, a little element of story, a little bit of motivation, because most games that came out in those days were like, uh, you know, space shooters. Uh, it was all it was all about, you know, getting the high score, stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, and just so you guys know, I'm still dealing with a little bit of the cold I had. I think I, I had some flu-like symptoms, so you, I might sniffle. Um, I don't want to go through and edit out all my sniffles, so just bear with me. And as you see, I could have, obviously, I showed the the route to go to get to the uh, warp pipe there. But uh, obviously, I'm not going to be doing any warping, so going straight through. Um, yeah, so... Like I said, uh, platformers, uh, some of my favorite genres, um, and uh, video games early on were all about the high score. Um, you basically were playing the same level over and over again, and it just got harder. And, um, you know, some games came along and tried to change that a little bit. Uh, you had Adventure way back in the day, um, it was kind of an action kind of an action RPG, early action RPG. Um, but you were basically a, a square dot, or that doesn't make sense, a square dot. You're basically this square going from room to room, uh, you know, kind of solving puzzles. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously games progress once the uh, technology got better, uh, memory storage and all that stuff got better. 
and uh, we got better visuals. And uh, actually, one of the first games are um, it was a platformer too. And one of the first platformers I remember being kind of blown away by was Smurfs. I think it was just Smurfs on the ColecoVision. Um, because it actually looked like Smurfs. It was one of the first games that actually looked like the characters that it was portraying. Um, so I thought the visuals in that were pretty good. And uh, obviously I continue to get blown away. Um, Donkey Kong was my first Nintendo game. You know, I didn't really recognize that weird name Nintendo at the time, but uh, obviously I've come to be a huge fan of them, so. Um, and yeah, obviously, um, Donkey Kong was basically Nintendo's first platformer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it started off being, well, it started off, uh, uh, I think it was called Radar Scope, was the uh, engine and uh, the build and uh, the game radar scope from Nintendo wasn't doing really well. And uh, that's when they tasked this young uh, designer, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, uh, to, uh, you know, try to make, try to do something with the game and make it better, make it sell, make, you know, make it popular in the arcade. And uh, he messed with it for a little bit and he was like, well, <laughs> There's nothing really I can do with this. So he kind of went back and revamped the whole thing. He used the engine um, and he created uh, Donkey Kong. And uh, a lot of you know that Nintendo got sued for Donkey Kong because uh, it was very similar to King Kong. And uh, turns out the company that sued them, I can't remember if it was Universal or not, which would be weird because now that now Nintendo is uh, obviously in those deals uh, with Universal to do uh, the Nintendo theme park stuff. Uh, I'm not sure if it was Universal or not, but I think it was a couple of companies that thought they had the rights to King Kong and it turns out neither one of them really did. And so Nintendo uh, won that lawsuit. Um, and we have Donkey Kong today. So that was pretty cool. But I remember there being a really crappy knockoff version of Donkey Kong, unlicensed version of Donkey Kong that was on Atari and it was terrible. Uh, visually and uh, gameplay wise it was stiff as hell um, so yeah so there's a little background on uh, Donkey Kong and then uh, Donkey Kong led uh, uh, in Donkey Kong I'm not sure if Mario was, was Mario he was originally called Jumpman I don't know if they actually changed that in Donkey Kong or not uh, but they eventually changed it uh, for the first Mario Brothers game, not Super Mario Brothers, but Mario Brothers. It was the uh, game where they were uh, in the sewer and they were basically cleaning up, cleaning the pipes, cleaning it up from all the vermin and whatnot. And uh, a lot of the mechanics from uh, the Super Mario Brothers we know uh, came from that game. And you played as Mario and Luigi. And um, funny little story about Mario. He his name. Uh, was taken from, I think it was the building supervisor. Um, when Nintendo first uh, came to America, they had this little office building in New York. And uh, I believe the supervisor that uh, uh, that that ran that building, uh, his name was Mario. And uh, he had a mustache and overalls and uh, wore a hat. And that's where they got the idea for Mario. That's where Shigeru Miyamoto uh, got the idea for Mario So that's cool and a lot of stuff um, um, I remember from my read-through of uh, the uh, what I call the Nintendo Bible and that is uh, uh, Game over press start to continue um, And it's you know, it's basically uh, how Nintendo came from you know meager uh, beginnings uh, become a you know being a uh, Japanese card kids card game company uh, to, then a toy company and then uh, uh, the video game giant that we know of today um, it talks about you know their struggle and uh, the things that they did uh, when they first started out and up until I think it's up until Nintendo 64 I don't know if it, 
I can't remember if the launch of 64 was in there or not, but I know it was either right before or right at the beginning of the launch of 64. So highly recommend that book if you're a Nintendo fan. Um, if you want some background, it is a really good read. You will not be bored. Um, surprisingly, uh, with the kind of stuff that you're talking about, it is really very interesting. So um, I highly recommend that. I've recommended it before. And uh, you guys should check it out. All right, so uh, here we are in World 2-2. Um, it's funny how I, I went through a lot of these early levels quickly without dying. Um, once I got my power up, I kind of held it. Uh, the Fire Flower, obviously, is uh, the best power up you can get as far as you know weaponized power ups in the first Super Mario Brothers and there's a little trick there I think it's more of a glitch people kind of call it a warp but it's not it's a glitch where you, uh, you can slide up under that little door before you, you leave uh, you can either if you're small it's easier um, I think you have to be small actually to, to do it but it basically takes you to the minus world and you're just stuck <laughs> you can't get out of it once you get in so it's a cool little Thing, uh, I remember me and my cousins discovering way back in the day um, I just forget how short these levels are these are pretty short levels um, I don't remember them being this short but I quickly obviously I just quickly ran through world 2-3 in a matter of seconds so and uh, here we are at the second castle world 2-4 and uh, I got six lives, which I'll be changing in the next world pretty drastically. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny because some of these uh, castles are just kind of foreshadowing to harder castles. And uh, this castle again shows up again, I want to say, in World 7. Uh, you'll see. I can't remember which one, but I think it's World 7. And it's pretty much the same. There's just more fireball stems and... There's a fireball stem here in that world. Uh, so yeah, pretty cool. Um, you know, obviously the memory limitations on the original NES, so they had to do stuff like re reuse assets and uh, that kind of stuff to uh, be able to fit the game on the cartridge. So I forget that when you hit the the axe, if uh, you killed Bowser, it doesn't open the bridge which makes sense I always thought Toad looked weird in this game it looked like he was weirdly proportioned um, so yeah this is the level um, which was when I first saw it back in the day I thought it was really cool to have a, a night level basically although the the clouds are really illuminated <laughs> for a night sky but you know again NES um, and it just, it kind of lends to the charm of it anyway, so. Yeah, I always thought it was, uh, pretty cool to see a, a night level for whatever reason, I don't know, in a video game, because I you didn't, you hadn't really had that variety before, uh, Super Mario Brothers came around. A uh, variety of gameplay and variety of stages, and you're actually just progressing through a level, and it's, it's different, it's not just... You know, you scroll and it's the same thing again with more enemies or something. I remember there being some kind of invisible power up here, but I can't find it. I thought there was something there. But oh well. Let's keep moving here. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, platformers I loved. Uh, I think my favorite Super Mario Brothers is probably... Super Mario Brothers 3 it's a it's almost a toss-up between that and Mario Super Mario World um, but it's weird because I really did love Super Mario Brothers 2 as well because it was so different um, and obviously the story behind that is uh, Super Mario Brothers 2 was pretty much like this one Super Mario Brothers uh, well, that's weird I must have screwed up the edit on that uh, Alright, so I'm just going to leave it. Um, obviously, I beat that level. 
And uh, at the end of the level, um, there's the turtle shell trick on the uh, when you come down the uh, there's just two turtles coming down uh, before the flagpole of the little mountain ding or whatever you want to call it. And if you jump on it just right, see you can see I have a weird uh, lives there. If you jump on it just right, you can just keep hitting it and getting lives, extra lives. Um, and uh, that's what I did at the end of the level. I don't know how I screwed up that edit. I'm just, I don't feel like going back and going through it. You can obviously tell, you know, there's no warping, obviously, in World 3. Um, the next warp, warp World is World 4. And, uh, you know, World 3 one is not hard to beat. So, uh, I hope that that shouldn't disqualify me. Uh, but, yeah, anyway, um, oh, what was I talking about before that weird edit? Um, it looks just like this mountain here and then the turtles are coming down you just jump on them jump on one the correct way and you get extra lives everybody knows the extra lives trick I'm sure if you're a fan of Super Mario Brothers uh, but yeah like I was saying yeah um, Super Mario Brothers 2 uh, uh, in Japan was very similar to this one Super Mario Brothers 1 but it was just really hard it was basically like a troll version <laughs> of uh, Super Mario Brothers America so it was more of the same, just you know, like harder. Um, kind of like when you beat this game, um, you get uh, basically a harder version of it. Um, all the Goombas become uh, the Beatles. Um, that's a character uh, or an enemy. I don't think they use it again since uh, Super Mario Brothers. Those uh, Beatles. But yeah, so it, it was just a harder version. Um, I guess they tested it, field test, not field test, whatever they do. Tested it in, the, uh, you know, kind of a survey thing with American audiences and found that they, that we just didn't like it as much as the first one. It was just too hard and we didn't like it. So they kind of doki doki panicked. <laughs> Those puns. So they kind of panicked and uh, took this other game made a uh, Nintendo made called Doki Doki Panic, only released in Japan. And uh, they kind of slapped Mario characters onto the original Doki Doki uh, characters. And uh, we got that as Super Mario Brothers 2. Um, I loved it. I'm glad that happened because Super Mario Brothers 2 uh, is the most different Super Mario Brothers game. And uh, it just it gave them cool, unique abilities and gave you a reason to play as everybody um, because you could, you know, float with uh, Peach. Uh, Mario was, I believe, just kind of all around strong and fast. Um, Toad, <laughs> weirdly, oddly enough, was the strongest, so he could pull things out of the ground the fastest. And uh, Luigi had this weird kind of flutter kick uh, when he jumped. So, very cool. Um, uh, one of my favorite enemies was, uh, uh, what was his name? Was it Toad? No, it wasn't Toad. It was uh, the frog. What was, uh, I'm drawing a blank right now. I can't remember uh, the villain uh, in Super Mario Brothers 2. Um, Wart. Wart. Uh, people kind of want Wart to come back in some shape or fashion. Um, Super Mario Bros. 2 is just uh, America, I should say Super Mario Bros. 2 America, Doki Doki Panic, was widely different. Um, and uh, I just, I missed that. I thought it was a really cool, um, you know, kind of black sheep of the Mario series and it was really fun and different and uh, you know some things they still used. Uh, they used uh, basically shy guys in uh, Mario Kart and in the uh, Yoshi games. Um, I know there's more. I just can't think of uh, stuff right now. I want to say the Pow Block came from Super Mario Brothers 2. I believe it did. The Pow Block. No, 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 it didn't. No, it was in. It was actually in Mario Brothers the original. So I'll take that back. But uh, I know there's other things like in it that I can't think of right now. Uh, but 
Yeah, um, so that was pretty cool. And uh, obviously Mario Brothers 3, I think, is my favorite because, it, again, it was very inventive with the uh, power-ups, uh, the raccoon suit, um, the Calypso music. I mean, how crazy do you have to be to make a video game about a Italian plumber uh, who can fly uh, once he gets a leaf power up, turns him into a flying raccoon, and he rocks out to Calypso music, and it work. <laughs> Only Nintendo can do that kind of stuff. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, you know, it's really late right now in this recording, so I'm kind of tighter, but yeah, tighted with. The, I'm so tired that I can't even say tired. Kind of tired, so uh, bear with me on that as well. Um, it's funny how I guess I—I I mean, I played this game so many times that I remember like uh, almost all the secrets. Um, it's kind of like muscle memory. Um, maybe not the controls so much, but um, definitely where stuff is. I remember, and I anticipate a lot of stuff before it happens in the game. Um, you'll see uh, uh, some of the uh, castle levels, the, the dash four levels. Um, I think two of them are kind of maze-like. And uh, I was really tempted to look online to remember the pattern, but I was like, nope, I'm just gonna run through it. Uh, I'll remember it. And uh, after a couple of tries, I remembered where you're supposed to go. Because if you don't go the right way, you just keep repeating the level. And obviously your time will run out and you'll die. So, it's weird that I remember. Um, <clears throat> I remember really liking this level too with the mushrooms. Because again, it was just different from the block world and the, the kind of craggy crevice uh, of the earlier levels. And of the later levels, it was just different. It was nice and colorful. And uh, I just like this whole world too because you're using these uh, moving platforms to get around. So, pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then, uh, since we're talking Mario games, uh, like I said, Mario Brothers 3 is probably my favorite. It introduced the, uh, the, uh, the world map where you can traverse. Was the first game that had that so you can see all the different levels and just kind of the world and the theme of the world as you're going around um, really cool power-ups um, the tanuki is probably the weird was it, is it tanuki? maybe the tanuki is the the leaf power-up I think no 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 it's it's the the full suit where you can turn it into a statue and you can, you can use it to fly as well. But uh, it was kind of wasted. It was like, you, wow, you can turn it into a statue to disappear for a while. Um, it was kind of useless. <laughs> so I got it because it, it was so rare in the game. I liked getting it because it was a rare, it was a rare power up. And uh, you know, I mostly use it so I could fly and do basically what you can do with the uh, the leaf power of the raccoon. So yeah, <clears throat> here we are, World 5-1. Um, another world that I like, cause uh, the cool uh, shading on the pipes and how they look, um, and the trees with the, look like lollipop, <laughs> you know, white lollipop trees. Again, um, you know, obviously memory limitations for these old games. And uh, Nintendo was just, you know, was really smart and inventive and just tried to come up with different ways to uh, to make the same worlds look different. And they did. I remember this being uh, a pipe you can go into. Again, muscle memory. I just remember a lot of this stuff uh, just going through the game. So pretty freaking cool that I remember all this stuff. I mean, we're talking, you know, 30 plus years since I, uh, well, not since I played it, but when I first played it, so. Yeah, I was a little kid and, you know, every day, you know, 
because you know a lot you know gamers gamers take uh, gaming for granted these days you know it's like oh man I, I got nothing to play there's no games no games no games um, well honestly that's not really that new because even when there were games I couldn't afford a lot of games um, mom would only buy so many grandma would only hook me up with so many and then you had to kind of trade and whatnot and borrow uh, from friends and stuff. So you played your games a lot, the same game. You played it a lot. Mega Man, I played tons. Um, Super Mario Brothers played a lot. Duck Hunt played a lot. Um, uh, Hogan's Alley and uh, what was the other one? Um, Gyromite, Gyromite. It's the game that came with uh, Rob the Robot. Um, that came with the action. I don't know if it was called action set. It was like the the main set, and it came with Rob the Robot and Gyromite. Really cool game. If you if you didn't have a friend to play with you, you could uh, use Rob, and he'll uh, move the platforms and stuff for you. Pretty pretty cool. And have his time oh, right into the pit there. But yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, you had to just kind of play your games over and over and over again. Um, Ninja Gaiden played, played that for a lot. Uh, Double Dragon played the crap out of Double Dragon. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, hated it, but I played the crap out of it because that's all I had um, new. And uh, Turtles 2 was that one. That's when they got uh, the beat em up. To perfection, I think. Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game. Uh, the, actually, the first time I played it was in the arcade, and it's you know, it's kind of a downer because the arcade versions were always so much better looking uh, visually. Uh, the animations and stuff were better, but I still loved uh, NES, uh, the NES uh, Ninja Turtles. Uh, t uh, t oh, yeah, Ninja Turtles 2, the arcade game. I uh, had a ton of fun with that. You got Blaster Master, um, uh, Star Tropics, obviously Legend of Zelda, Metroid. Um, but a lot of those games I didn't own. Like we had to share. I shared an NES basically with my cousins. And um, whichever my older cousin, he was a gamer too. So he would always end up getting new games from friends or he'd buy them because he had a job and. Uh, we were just little kids. We couldn't go out and buy our own games, so um, we played a lot of his games and stuff. So fortunate that way. Uh, like I always, I often say, um, my favorite game console of all time was the N64, and that was um, obviously because it was a revolutionary system. But with the, you know amazing revolutionary games, many games on that system. Are still considered to be the greatest games of all time, uh, Ocarina of Time being one. Um, but the, I think the main reason was that I was able to buy my own games. I could, I had a job, I had a little part-time job, and I was able to buy my own games for the first time. And that's when I really enjoyed what it was to be a gamer. I really got in. Um, so that's when I, you know, self-identified as a gamer. Uh, was the N64 era, so. Yep, here we go, World 5-4. I always thought it was weird to why they didn't just give you a number when you when you did the uh, the uh, one-up trick. Uh, just give you this weird, just give you this crown and this weird kind of shape that dissolves the more you die, and then I think that shape turns into uh, letters of the alphabet so at least when you got to letters of the alphabet you know what is it 27 letters in the alphabet at least when you know you got the uh, crown X that you had 20 at least 27 lives actually I think um, once you finish all the letters that's when you get to numbers so it could have been like 37 lives so but uh, I remember if you did it too much, if you like got too many one ups on that uh, that little trick on World Three One. 
at the end. If you did it, if you got them too much, if you got too many, um, you you can die one time and then your whole game will be over. So it was, uh, it was basically trying to keep you uh, from not being greedy. Uh, you know, even uh, on uh, One Up Lives on the Super Mario Brothers, Nintendo was trying to feed some morality to you to not be greedy. Because greed will get you killed quickly, even if you think you have a lot of lives. So that was pretty cool. Oh, look at that save. I got over Bowser's head there and without getting touched. So that's cool. Yeah, Toad, it's like he's weird. He's just a weird shape. But again, you know, the limitations of the hardware, that's what you had. All right, so I'm just kind of standing here. I don't know what happened. Probably distracted by the Churins. And, uh... Here we are in World 6-1. I actually didn't remember that World 6-1 was a, a nighttime world. Um, you know, because, I mean, I had, obviously I beat this game straight through before, but... Uh, once you, you do that a couple times, it's like, I'm just going to warp. And so, I would usually warp through. Uh, warp from... World... I'd usually like to go to World 3 because I wanted to get the extra lives on that trick. So I'd go to World 3, play it through to World 4, and then you can warp at World 4 to World 8 if you wanted to, so... Here I'm trying to check for secrets because I remember there being more secrets around here, but or at least I think thought there were. I remember when I was a kid, I used to hate these freaking uh, what's he called? Uh, what is he called? The, uh, I can't think of his name right now. But I used to hate him, you know, dropping these freaking we called them porcupines. I don't know what the uh, game's official name for him is, but I used to hate levels with that. So four, four, one, six, one has the little uh, Lakitu, Lakitu, that's his name. Uh, little Lakitu. And it's funny because like every game since, I don't know, maybe not every game since, but 2D Mario. Beyond 2D Mario's and we get to 3D Mario's, Lakitu is actually mostly a good guy, so. He's, uh, the camera guy in Super Mario 64, so, um, he's supposed to be recording the action, uh, so you can see Mario in third person, and it's, Lakitu is supposed to be the camera, so, that was pretty cool, that they were thinking on that level. Yeah, so, uh, again, a lot of these sewer levels that you go in the pipe are kind of reused, pretty similar. I wonder why they never brought the beetle back. He's pretty uh, predominant in this game, so. Um, kind of weird. I remember hating like going in pipes and then finding out it's gonna it's a short little water world water level and I always would try to breeze through and get hit like I just did but it's all good I just I don't know I remember when I was a kid these levels were quite quite hard and I dreaded dreaded world 8 because uh, I said how these levels are short but World 8 had long levels and the catch to World 8 was that um, even though the, sh the short levels in the worlds before 8 um, there was kind of a you know a checkpoint um, it never came out and said checkpoint but once you got about halfway through the level if you died you would start halfway through the level except in World 8 if you die you can be right at the flagpole and die in World 8 and have to start all the way from the beginning so that was the uh that added to the difficulty of world eight which i will be in you know a couple worlds 
it's kind of crazy how, uh, how much of this game is just in my memory. You can see things like that. You can like your jumps sometimes don't time right. Your you know your controls aren't. But for the time, I mean, there weren't tighter controls on any game than Super Mario Brothers, and that's one of the things that helped it uh, in its appeal. A lot of people liked it a lot because it was really tight controls. Um, it didn't troll you. Um, it was if you missed a jump, it was probably your fault. So that was always cool about these games. But Mario games in general, um, uh, that's a testament to a really good platformer. Is uh, tight platformer controls. Uh, I just fell in the hole. But uh, yeah, um, it's very, uh, very important in a platformer is the controls. You can get away with some games not having super precise controls, but uh, and uh, like I said, for its time, these were really tight controls. Obviously, the advances in controllers, um, controls are better for these types of games. But uh, if you played and learned on this, you were good to go. You, yeah, they, this game future proofed you as far as uh, being able to play uh, uh, platform games. So, um, I don't know what should I talk about now. Um, because I can keep on talking about Mario, obviously. Uh, Mario Super Mario World was the uh, the Super Nintendo Mario game, and uh, I remember the first time I saw it. And just being completely blown away uh, in the commercial by the giant bullet bill. That was like one of the first commercials. Uh, to and it showed you, it showcased um, the giant bullet bill, and I knew I was playing with superpower at that point because there was no way my NES could display that kind of stuff. And it was just so much more colorful and vibrant. And then, of course, uh, Yoshi. Having Yoshi in the game was a big plus for me. I remember uh, thinking it was the coolest thing ever that Mario was riding something through the, through the level. Um, so I always thought that was the the it was one of my first memories of a. Uh, Super Mario World it was the giant bullet bill in the commercial and seeing Mario jump on Yoshi's back. Very cool stuff. Uh, my eyes just lit up. I was like, I gotta have that. And I actually had a Sega Genesis at the time. Um, I actually got a Sega Genesis before I got a Super Nintendo. In true Nintendo fan fashion. But yeah, um, Super Nintendo came out like two years after the Genesis did in America. So Genesis had a nice head start. And, uh, but Genesis didn't have enough of the games that I loved, which were platformers. I love platformers and Sonic, you know, Sonic isn't really a platforming game. Obviously it, there is some platforming to it, but it's more of an action game uh, based on, you know, speed and stuff. So, and uh, I I love Sonic. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, to me, is the best 2D Sonic. Um, and the best Sonic game of all time. I remember, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't gotten to the end of uh, Sonic 2, that was just one of the most epic battles ever. You know? Um, I believe you don't have any rings. Um and you're in a space station and you face off against Mecha Eggman. I mean, I remember the first time I played that. Like, I remember that like it was yesterday. I was sitting in the living room and I had gotten that far and I was sweating and it was just about to be, it was about to be dinner time. I think we ate dinner probably be like 5.30 or 6 that day and uh, I remember just like, you know, it was cool because it, it let you continue. So that wasn't a problem. But having no rings just was like frustrating as hell. I think you got like maybe one ring. I might be wrong. I think you got a ring 
as you were like running up to the Mecha Bowser, but or Mecha Bowser, Mecha um, Eggman, and uh, that was one of the most epic battles I remember having in a video game, and I just remember it like it was yesterday. It was very, very cool, and uh, yeah. So, like I said, uh, Sega Genesis didn't have a ton of uh, platforming games. Uh, it was more action oriented, you know. So it had like Altered Beast and Shinobi and stuff like that. Love Shinobi. Uh, my favorite Shinobi is probably. Uh, Shinobi 3 it was just was yeah it was just so much gameplay variety in that game you know, you're riding a horseback you're riding a freaking uh, jet ski um, surfboard kind of a jet surfboard um, the only thing that game was missing for me was like having the dog because um, the dog and shadow dancer was just so cool to have just so cool to have that dog and use it to attack people and then you um, they basically it's kind of like a stun it would attack people and then you can go handle them love Sh and the music oh, the music in shinobi games was always so good shadow dancer and uh i don't know which one they're both taught it's like a toss-up which one had a better music with shadow dancer and uh shinobi 3 i didn't i never really liked shinobi 2 it felt kind of a generic to me I played it, but I don't think I ever beat it because it was just kind of generic and boring. But um, uh, I played Shinobi on the uh, unlicensed one uh, from Tengen on the NES. Tengen did a lot of unlicensed games, and it came, and all the games had that black, weird black cartridge with like gold and like the Tengen symbol, which is kind of like a little bullseye red line thing. But, uh, yeah, I remember playing Shinobi. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, Super er, Sega Genesis, man. Uh, that run, you know, like I, that was my first. No, no, no. I was gonna say it was my first console that was mine, but no, that would be the Atari Fifty Two Hundred. My mom bought. Uh, I think she pretty much bought that thing for herself and said uh, I can have it because <laughs> it had. Uh, it had. A nearly arcade perfect port of uh, Pac-Man, and I had Pac-Man. I had Space Invaders, almost a near a nearly arcade perfect port, and uh, what was the other? James Bond 007. I can't remember. Um, I just remember. I remember it like it was so damn long ago. I remember like driving his car. It was, it was like a side scroller. And uh, you drove his car over pits and stuff. It was pretty weird, I think, for a James Bond game. But, you know, technology wasn't really there to do a game like that justice yet. Uh, I think the Atari 5200 came out in like 82 or 83. I didn't get it then. Well, I got it probably in 86. Or 87. It was super cheap because uh, it didn't sell well. I think my mom bought it brand new um, for like 50 bucks. And uh, before the original Xbox, that was <laughs> the VCR. That thing is huge. Um, it, it has unnecessary space because you could, it had like a storage compartment in the back uh, where you could put your uh, your controllers. It was like weird, um, but you know, consoles were weird back then as far as the design. Uh, I remember the Atari 5200 had like the wood grain finish <laughs> because that's what people's entertainment centers looked like in those days. Um, and it had like the switches and the knobs and stuff. But uh, Atari 5200, it had the, you know, it was kind of slick in its design, but it was just like huge. And like I said, it was necessarily big because it had storage compartments for your controllers. And that was pretty unnecessary. But uh, speaking of controller, the Atari 5200 controller was trash. It was just not good at all. It had button places weird. 
um, you know, Google it if you want to look it up. It had the uh, traditional arcade uh, stick, and but it had like it, it was shaped like a, a old VCR remote, and it had you know numbers from zero uh, through nine. And uh, I think you could use overlays on that one too. I can't remember, but um, it was just weird. <laughs> and horrible it was hard to control um it wasn't made for platformers and uh it wasn't until nintendo's uh gimmick or excuse me innovation of the d-pad uh that a lot of games that used to suck were really good because uh the standard controller in those days was a stick with you know one or few one or more face buttons that was the standard, and uh, Nintendo uh, innovated, you know, you know, with the D-pad, and uh, obviously other things going ahead. But I'm going to do a video on that because uh, people don't <laughs> understand what standard is. I don't think they understand what innovation is, what standard means, and you know, how do you break standards? Um, so I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a video on that. It won't be too long, but I think it'll I think it's very poignant. It's ne very necessary in this community because I'm gonna hear some weird stuff about what standard means, what's a quote unquote regular controller, that kind of stuff. So yeah, uh, here we are on World Seven Four, and uh, like I said, this is that. This is one of the castles that has a pattern and I'm just like, I could have easily just stopped this and looked it up online, but I'm like, I was determined to remember how to do it myself. And so I go through it a few times and uh, end up just kind of remembering. Ooh, look, it's different now. Unless it did something right. So yeah, that was the uh, pattern breaker. And then you get over here and you're like, what? And I don't know how I made that. Because I was, I remember feeling like I'm going to jump. But then he starts throwing all those damn hammers at the top. And I'm like, uh. So I pull back and luckily it got under. So, all right, 8-1. So this is, these levels used to be so intimidating to me. Um, so even when you warped. You know, you still had to contend with these levels. You still had to beat them. So I just remember being really intimidated by World 8. And I think they just kind of went on through till even now. Um, the World 8 and Super Mario Brothers. Oh, man. That thing was intimidating. I don't think I ever beat that straight through. Um, I used uh, the little Akitu Clouds and the uh, p-wings to just fly over levels um but the lakitu the lakitu clouds would let you um skip you know beat a level you can go over it because you're in, your, you're in the world map and so you could easily kind of just uh use the power up and it'll push you past the world without having to beat it but if you didn't beat the next world it would push you back so you couldn't die you had to you had to skip it and then like beat the next world or it would push you back behind it so yeah, I was just thinking about you know the warp um I don't believe are there warps in Super Mario Brothers 2 I don't remember I don't think so but obviously there are definitely ones in 3 and the warp in 3 is the flute Instead of the pipes, it's the uh, flute, and if you play the tune, and it'll come whisk you away. And here's a little Easter egg. The tune in Super Mario Brothers, when you play the flute, is what they use to compose the opening music for Ocarina of Time. Ooh. Um, if you play the little flute, in uh, Super Mario Brothers, you'll get this little chime. Doo, 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 doo. 
And if you know, if you're a veteran of Ocarina of Time, that's how it starts off. That's uh, the little tune. Do 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 do. That's what I mean. That's what, one of the things I love about Nintendo, man. That fan service, um, and they, you know, they continue to do that with like um, Skyward Sword. Like Skyward Sword's theme music is Zelda's lullaby in reverse. Freaked me out when I first heard that. I mean, goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps now thinking about it. All you got to do is play. Um, uh, Zelda's Lullaby in reverse and it is exactly it's perfect like how did they come up with that how do you flip a song and it's good enough and not weird sounding enough and it, it's another song and that's crazy to me um how does it go dun 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 and you flip it around is uh um now I forgot Zelda's little ball, how that goes. Uh, that's it. I mean, that's crazy. You flip it around and it's a totally different song and they use it as the theme music <laughs> for Skyward Sword. That was just bananas when I first heard that. So, yeah, it, it's stuff like that that makes Nintendo Nintendo and makes me a fan, man. Very cool how they do that I don't know how I've been able to ramble on this whole time we're in world 8-3 now this world used to freak me out too this world is cool because it has like all these hidden blocks inside the little castle wall but I'm not worried about none of that I'm just trying to get through um, it's funny how how intimidated I used to be by this stuff especially these little hammer brother section but uh now and I don't even think about it it's kind of been playing it so long for so many years it's just like second nature now I think I'm you know and yeah by the way I die quite a I don't want to say quite a few times but I die um, in this playthrough probably 20 20 times um, it's mostly in the uh, the later castle levels um, you know obviously I'll have some I'll have a platforming mishap miss a jump um, I've left some of the uh, my deaths in here so um, but I'm not just yeah so you'll see like the score jump up in the left right or the left uh, left right <laughs> up in the top left you'll see the score jump um, from some time, from time to time, and that's because I probably we died a couple times, and I just kind of edited around it. I can't believe I edited out the friggin', uh, you know, three one at the end where you can do the one up trick. I do not feel like going. I might put that back in. So if you're hearing this and it's back in, then you know I just said screw it and threw it back in. Uh, so. Here we are, 8-4, the final level in the game. And this level also has, I forgot about it until I started playing it, obviously, but it also has a maze element to it. So you gotta go on the right pipes and all that kind of stuff and go on the right level. I think this is the playthrough where I, I, I don't think I uh, left any of my deaths in this level. I think I probably died like six times um, when I played through this level six or seven times. And it was, you know, a lot of trying to remember the pattern. I knew once I got to this underwater level, I knew, yep, this is it. There's no more maze after this. I don't think, I think, yeah, there's, I think there's one more thing. But, uh, they don't give you any power-ups to get big <laughs> they just <laughs> this is a troll level um, and then they throw you in the water with freaking uh, fireball stems I don't know how that works but you know if Spongebob <laughs> is underwater and he's they have to deal with you know regular gravity then I guess uh, Mario can do that kind of stuff in this in a video game so and yeah uh, 
you know, you just got to be patient. Uh, you know, don't try to fight them. And then you get it past all that. And you can, uh, there we go. And uh, there she is. Not Toad this time. It's Princess Peach. And it's weird because Princess Peach looks more like Princess, um, the princess from uh, Princess Daisy because of her hair. She doesn't have blonde hair. I think that was a limitation. I think they wanted to do it, but they couldn't because her her skin tone looks kind of blonde and just put that in her hair too. You know, you wouldn't be able to see her basically. So um, I think she was always intended to be blonde, but they couldn't do it on the NES. So she looks more like Princess Daisy than she does Peach here. So. But uh, yeah, there it is. Thank you, Mario. Quest is over. We present you with a new quest. Push button B to select. And that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, and the subscriber who wanted this, wanted me to do it, I hope you enjoyed it. And peace out. Oh yeah, one more thing. Play Nintendo, fools.